place the GNC base pair down. We now take the AT base pair and place it down as well. We can see they have virtually the same external dimensions. So the distances on the outside of the AT base pair and the GC base pair are essentially the same. Now when we start to recognise the relevance of this, it takes us through to the next slide. And now what you can see is that DNA essentially consists of a series of connected bases. So it's now no longer the case for us to consider an AT base pair or GC base pair. Rather now what we need to consider is, or focus upon is particularly the features of just one of these two sets of connections. Let me try and steer you through this. What you can see on the left hand side of the image over here is A, G, C, A, C, G and T. A, C, G and T are working their way down the left hand side without discussing a polarity of order just from top to bottom of this image. And top to bottom of this image you can see T, G, C, A. Now importantly over here of course, without reading directions, there's a couple of key features that come out. One of them of course is we'd like to have a rule that tells us which order do we read our bases on just one of these strands. Do we read from top to bottom or from bottom to top? The second thing you can ask the question on over here is, what does it mean when these bases are connected up with the phosphates? And the sugar is of course there too. So we have the base, sugar, phosphate. And what you can start just in the left hand most side and of course the right hand most side is that there's a sugar phosphate backbone. And that backbone is just like our own backbone, essentially from that backbone is the extension of a series of, in our cases, ribs. But in this particular case, of course, we're looking at the extension of bases. Let's carry the story through further. What you can start to pick out over here is that each of those connections on the way in the sugar phosphate backbone seems to be fairly constant. In many ways then, we can almost ignore the features of the backbone because the information content is not particularly there. If the information content is not there, we can always know that it's present. After all, that's the structure of this particular strand of DNA. But more importantly, in so far as the direction of reading is concerned, can you see how there happens to be a particular polarity that's dictated by the shape of the deoxyribose? Now that deoxyribose, that, and I'd recommend you have a look at this in one of your textbooks, is essentially described in terms of its five locations on the ring structure. And what you can start to pick out is the location particularly for the carbons. There's one protruding carbon off one side, ring structure of course consisting of oxygen inside. And if we label each of those carbons, one with a little prime symbol, two prime, three prime, four prime, five prime, we start to notice that the two key linkage locations for the base and of course for the phosphates over here happen to course to involve commonalities. And in terms of the backbone, the backbone now consists of five prime to three prime connections. Now that's important because as you pick up this book of life, like the description of the order of bases now, we can decide whether to read it five prime to three prime or three prime to five prime. It's like each of these deoxyriboses consists of particular arrow pointing. And by convention, we have decided as a research community that the arrow points five prime to three prime. So that is the order by which we read our bases over here. So in that way now, you can read your bases A, C, G and T on the left hand most side. And you can see one final part of the story. As these bases are all connected up, but of course we've shown this in a fairly flat manner in this image. But of course most of you already know that DNA is not presented as a flat structure, but rather as a three dimensional structure. And on the next slide here, what you can see is the classical Watson and Crick story or structure. And I think this is just wonderful because there are two images shown over here, both of which really draw out the essence of the structure of this classical model of DNA. On the left hand side, courtesy of the Science Museum, you can see over here this classical description of the Watson Crick version. One are calling classical, well the answer is that that happens to be the same model that Watson and Crick developed in terms of their description of the three dimensional structure of DNA. 
and you can start to pick out those very stacked faces on the left hand side but of course a much clearer description comes through from the diagrammatic and that's shown on the right hand side over here on the right hand side you can see a description of where the phosphates are and of course the sugars leading in towards the bases and you saw from the previous slide it's far more obvious here now that the bases sit within the double helix this is a double helical structure two strands intertwining of DNA with a right-handed twist. The direction your hand moves in, following your thumb, watch your fingers move, it's a right-handed double helix. Now, look further at the features. As I said, the bases are on the inside, they're protected from the external environment. There are some interactive components, such as proteins, which can sense by feeling the outside of the structure what some of the base content is like. But of course the major features of those bases are involved in base pairing and base stacking within the structure because they stack directly as a series of base pairs one above the other. We now know there's a bit of twist involved in a number of these bases but this classical model though describes this kind of neat monotonous stacking process. Now the distance between each of these base pairs stacked one above the other is 3.4 angstroms when angstrom is 10 to the minus 10 meters. So the distance over here between the bases is incredibly small. The distance is, uh, of course, become far more profound. We appreciate that because this is a coil structure, there are the order of 10 turns per 10 bases, uh, 10 base pairs between each of the particular components now that constitutes a single twist within DNA. 10 multiplied by the 3.4 angstrom spacing then tells you the distance across a single twist of the double helix is 34 angstroms. In other words, just a few nanometers in terms of a single twist of DNA. The story doesn't stop there. We're looking at the overall width, if you like, at the diameter of DNA, the double strand of DNA, and that's of the order of 20 angstroms. So you can see now a very thin, almost wispy style strand, but one which can extend a very long distance, such that, for example, if we were to take the 20 through haploid chromosomes of human DNA, take all the DNA out of there, of the rest chromosomes, uh, lay them all side by side, you'd get roughly a meter in length. And of course, since most of our cells are diploid, two copies of each of the chromosomes, there is two meters or so of DNA specifically wound up and tucked within a single nucleus of each of our cells that are nucleated. Of course, not the red blood cells, which have no nuclei. That shows you how remarkably thin this material is. It also shows you how exquisitely packed the DNA is directly inside the nucleus to still allow it to be copied and read. Finally, of course, we recognize the DNA as over here must be opened up to allow its copying and its proper reading. So, what can we interpret from the structure of DNA? Moving across the next slide, what you can see now is that because we always know that opposite an A is a T and opposite a G is a C, that if we simply look at one of the strands only, we can now infer the content of its partner strand in double stranded DNA. So in this example on the left hand side there you can see a C G base pair. If we only had the C we would know there would be a G base paired to it. On the right hand side you can see an A T base pair. If we just had a T or an A we'd know what its corresponding partner would be. For the T would be an A of course part of the base pair process. Indeed I've also taken these particular images deliberately as part of a much larger structure. That larger structure involves an enzyme called ECOR1 which happens to recognize a short sequence within DNA and it happens to bind and cut a particular part of that sequence. So that information of course is detected by a series of, of interactions between one molecule and another molecule. In this case the protein ECOR1 and the DNA, double strand DNA. But let's take a back a step. Let's now start to ask the question about how DNA itself might be copied. Because the copying process tells you something about the use of this information content contained within DNA. Not so much to make the components of the cell other than, of course, the components required for information being carried from one generation to the next. DNA replication, the copying of DNA. In the slide, you can